It is said that revenge is the single most satisfying feeling in the world. But there's one type of scenario which can surpass vengeance in personal satisfaction. The I told you so. History is full of examples of brave souls mocked and ridiculed for their unpopular opinions and statements, only to be proven right, sometimes over decades and sometimes in less than a day. Here are 10 famously vindicated vouchers who were scoffed at, then found to be correct. Amazing! Number 10. Saving a Rainbow and a Hit Arguably the most timeless hit from any musical ever filmed. The song Over the Rainbow, as performed by Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz, was nearly cut from the cinematic release of the film. Producers felt the song dragged down the pacing of the script and was extraneous, since Dorothy's wanderlust and dreams of life beyond Kansas aren't absolutely essential to the plot. Even Wizard of Oz producer Mervyn Lee Roy was on board with cutting the beautiful song, but Arthur Freed, an associate producer helped Leroy visualise what a performance of the ballad would look and sound like in the film. The financier fell in love with the melody and threatened to quit the production if executives did not allow the song to be left in. A fun fact is the song originally contained a rather maudlin and potentially cliche first verse, which was trimmed away. It was a good call because nearly a century later, Garland's opening line, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, is known around the world as a message of eternal hope. Number 9. Robert Trent Jones's Mic Drop Did you know that the best personal revenge story and coolest mic drop moment in sports history may have come from a hobbyist who wasn't even playing in a competition? Robert Trent Jones was a 20th century architect of thousands of golf courses, including a remodeling of the historic American course Baltisrol from 1948 to 1952. But Baltisrol Country Club president Hobart Ramsey didn't like Jones's new version of the fourth hole. Ramsey was a thorn in the architect's side for years, leading a group of club members in claiming that the new fourth hole was a mile long and unfairly difficult. Jones, a proud man but only an amateur golfer, invited Ramsey and a group of sports writers onto the partially landscaped course to try it out. With a cigar in his mouth, Jones took an easy swing from the fourth tee and hit a hole in one. You're wrong, he said, and strutted away from his speechless nemesis. Bolter's role reopened just the way Jones designed it, and Ramsey would live with the ignominy of having played straight man in a classic sports legend. Number 8. John B. Gurdon's Nobel Prize Legendary scientist John B. Gurdon received terrible reviews from his science teachers in school. In fact, one wrote that Gurdon's work was far from satisfactory and that it would be a complete waste of time for sending the young man to pursue a career in the sciences. Upon going to university at Oxford, Gurdon reluctantly agreed to choose a major in history. But through an accounting error, or perhaps clever manipulation by a determined student, Gurdon ended up deep in the zoology department. The rest is history. Gurdon was to become the first scientist to successfully clone a frog, dubbed the Frankenfrog. He would receive a Nobel Prize for Biology in 2012. Gurdon later framed a report card from his former science teacher, signed one P. Chusby, which labelled Gurdon's efforts as disastrous. Number 7. Kotaku Wamura and the Fudai Floodgate. Around 50 years ago, Maya Kotaku Wamura of the Japanese village Fudai suffered from terrible visions of a tsunami destroying his beloved town. For years he fought with the public and politicians, arguing for a very expensive and vast flood wall as protection, reasoning that a nearby dam could cause an eruption of high water that would level the small village. Wamura got his wish, but was met with ridicule. The wall was 51 feet high and took over a decade to construct, and villagers considered it an unnecessary waste of money and resources. Fast forward to the tsunami of 2011. A tragic number of towns, cities and villages were destroyed or badly damaged. But guess whose town of 3,000 residents were kept almost completely safe and sound? That's right, Fudai. Wamura was no longer alive to be personally vindicated in 2011, but thankful townsfolk still visit his grave to leave flowers and messages of immense gratitude. Number 6. Joe Namath and Super Bowl 3 In the 1960s, the American football Super Bowl was not yet a bona fide sports holiday, featuring evenly matched professional teams. 
Instead, it was an exhibition game that featured the winner of one league, the old established National Football League, against the underdog American Football League, a scrappy upstart without the NFL's purse strings or pull in the media. The National Football League's representatives won the first two Super Bowls very easily, and when the powerful Baltimore Colts qualified for Super Bowl III in January 1969, they were considered a shoo-in for easy victory. But their American Football League opponents, the New York Jets, offered the brand new star Joe Namath, a brash young field general with movie star looks and supreme confidence. Before the Super Bowl, Namath smiled at reporters who scoffed at his team's chances and said that the Jets were going to win. He guaranteed it. In front of a disbelieving crowd, New York beat Baltimore 16-7 to win the clash of rival leagues and Namath became forever synonymous with one of the greatest called shots in American history. Number 5. Meteors and the British Science Establishment In the early 1800s, British scientific authorities proclaimed that the idea of shooting stars falling to earth was a superstitious myth and they weren't the only ones who believe it. Even Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, went on record to state that stones did not simply fall from the sky, but a few brave researchers disagreed. Ernst Friedrich Chladny published a book at the turn of the 18th century, which proposed that meteorite discoveries were related to fireballs in the sky, or meteors as we know them today. Soon, a rockfall, discovered by astronomer Jean-Baptiste Biot in 1803, would help set things straight. Biot proved that a thousand stones had fallen in an elliptical pattern, which fit the known hypothesis for how the aftermath of a disintegrating fireball would appear littered on the ground. Events in America would quickly vindicate Chladny even further. In December 1807, a shooting star known as the Western Fireball disintegrated and fell to Earth in the northeastern United States. A research team of professors from Yale University collected over 300 pounds of meteorite from the path of the fireball. Jefferson remained unconvinced, saying that a lie coming from Yale was more likely than hot rocks falling from heaven. But soon, European and American scientists would begin to see it Chladni's way, and the study of meteors falling to Earth became credible on both continents. Number 4. Gustav Molath's Hidden Insight In 2006, the German government condemned conspiracy theorist Gustav Molath to six years of institutionalization in a mental hospital. Why? When defending himself in court against charges of domestic abuse and vandalism, Molath told the judge, that the moon landing had been faked, a common trope of off-the-rails conspiracy talk. The transcript also contained page after page of ranting about Idi Amin, the African ruler, and how his life and Molath's somehow supposedly intersected. But strangely, his testimony also focused on Hypoverinsk Bank, the bank at which his wife had worked. Molath accused the bank of involving his family in illegal money laundering practices, which sounded as insane to the court as the rest of his claims. The ranting and raving man was diagnosed as a paranoid delusional. But wait! In 2012, a whistleblower showed that the bank really did engage in illegal money laundering and that many of Molath's specific claims held water. Score 1 for the Moon Conspiracy Theorists Number 3. Michael Burry and the Big Short American doctor and inventor Michael Burry was riding high in the early 2000s, making enormous profits for his associates through the investment firm Cyan Capital. But Burry made a daring, risky move. In 2005, he noticed that the subprime market, or homes and real estate sold to less than optimal investors, could collapse due to a growing and irresponsible bubble created by soft money and easy loans. Burry wanted to bet against the market, so went out of his way to persuade investment banks to create a financial product that would allow him to do just that. He convinced Goldman Sachs to sell him credit default swaps, which they happily agreed to. They thought it was easy money since the housing market appeared to be so solid. Meanwhile, other investors scoffed and continued believing in the housing boom. Before the housing market burnt into flames, a few of Burry's investors got cold feet and pulled out, angry at Michael's current trades, which put them at a current loss prior to the crash. Pity them. As the avalanche finally began to fall, Michael Burry pocketed a cool $100 million profit on his shorting of the subprime market, reaching unprecedented returns of 489% in the eight years he ran his hedge fund. Then, in the first quarter of 2008, 
Upon liquidating his company, Michael sent investors a letter with the following photo attached. He goes on to claim that black swans, which are also a term to express a really rare market event such as the financial crash, are in fact predictable, therefore proving his naysay is wrong. His cunning wisdom is portrayed by Christian Bale in The Big Short. Number 2. A sophomore proves his professors wrong. Gregory Watson, a sophomore at the University of Texas in 1982, wrote a term paper about amendments to the United States Constitution. During his research, he discovered that an amendment proposed by the Founding Fathers in 1789 restricted Congress from raising their own salaries. Not surprisingly, the proposal had sat on the books for centuries, with representatives and senators all too happy to continue voting for their own raises. But then Watson argued forcefully in his paper that the amendment had no time limit and could still be ratified. An assistant professor incredibly gave him a C and argued that ratifying a 200-year-old amendment would be unthinkable. When he visited Professor Sharon Waite to ask for a revised grade, she reportedly became so frustrated with what she viewed as the student's insolence that she threw his own report at him. Watson took personal offence, calling and badgering every legislative body and journalist he could think of. Soon, Maine would ratify the amendment and over 30 states would quickly follow. In 1992, the 27th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States became law and Congress found their gravy train to be at least a little bit slowed in its tracks. There's no word on whether Professor Waite has ever offered Gregory a remark. Number 1. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone. New social mediums are a difficult adjustment for common folk and business leaders alike. Ten years ago, for example, looking for romantic dates on the internet was still considered creepy by most. A decade later, and almost everyone is completely on board with it. Companies like Tinder capitalising with massive profits. But it's hard to believe that the invention of the telephone, possibly the most important communication device of all time, was also scoffed at upon its invention. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell obtained a patent for an apparatus for transmitting vocal and other sounds telegraphically. Or in other words, a telephone. He prepared to market the new device after successful public demonstrations, but not everyone was impressed. One representative of Western Union put down the telephone as an unnecessary gimmick, saying that the company had plenty of messenger boys already. Fast forward 150 years, and an old-fashioned telegram is the outdated and extraneous gimmick. The telephone, morphed into office phones, cell phones, Androids and Apple products, has become a one-stop shop for personal and business conversation. Hopefully this video will lead you to work hard to prove others who doubt you wrong. Did you learn anything new? Also, which story did you think was the best? And do you know of any others? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave it a like and subscribe, clicking that bell icon to never miss a new video. Thanks for watching.